welcome Domiti to this uh, interview series on sh showcasing HKIAC's leadership. We're really glad to have you. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. So what I want to do today is give a, an overview of your professional profile and your career to date and then start the interview. So, right. Yep. <laughs> so you're you have a unique profile in a number of important ways that we'll come on to. Um, you are a dual French New Zealand national. Your legal education was obtained in France and in New Zealand. You're admitted first in New Zealand in 1996, also in England and Wales and in Geneva. And you started your career as a commercial litigator in New Zealand. And for those who are not aware, in New Zealand, you're admitted as a solicitor and a barrister, which means that in addition to acting as a solicitor, you also appear in court from a very early stage in your career. That's correct. Yeah. Um, so after several years litigating in New Zealand, you moved back to France and you joined the international arbitration team at Freshfield Paris which was then led by Jan Paulsen. Yes. Uh, and from that time, you were working exclusively in international arbitration, and that has been true since that time, which was 2001, uh, international commercial arbitration and also international investment treaty arbitration. Uh, you were with Pressfields for three and uh, between three and four years, and then you moved to Geneva and joined La Livre in 2004. You became a partner at La Livre in 2008, and then you joined the management of La Livre in 2015. That's correct. Yes, and over, over your years in international arbitration, you have received a lot of recognition and accolades from your peers, from your colleagues, your clients, your adversaries, with respect to the quality of your work. Um, and we'll talk about one of those accolades soon. Um, and you've also, of course, held a number of very important positions in international arbitral institutions and different arbitral organizations. For example, you were recently elected to the ECA governing board. You've sat on the ICC Court of Arbitration. And also, luckily and happily for HKIAC, in June this year, you were appointed to our governing board, which is our council, and also our proceedings committee, which is the, the standing committee that takes a range of procedural decisions on the cases under our auspices. So uh, to my first question, and that is with respect to the one of the accolades I mentioned, and that is uh, an accolade that you won back in 2018. It was the GAR Art Award for the best prepared and most responsive arbitrator, which I have to say is uh, what a great award to win. This is an award that is recognized from your peers. Um, and you won it at a time when you had a very busy docket as counsel. You were also, of course, as I mentioned, part of the management team at La Livre, in addition to all of the other important roles in your life. And so what I would like to ask you is how, well, what are the secrets to your success in terms of um, being best prepared and most responsive as an arbitrator on such a consistent basis? Thank you, uh, Sarah, and thanks again for, for inviting me. Uh, I was listening to you uh, talking about my profile, and uh, I, I think I'm blushing a little bit. <laughs> I don't know if you can, if you can see it. Um, you know, I, I'm not sure I would call them secret of success, because probably I don't like the word uh, success so much. Uh, but to me, it comes down to three rules or, or, or three principles that I... I, I, I try to follow, and I think there's no way around them. Uh, the first one is there's no substitute to hard work. Uh, I always say that there's no lift, there's no elevator. You've got to keep working, you've got to keep climbing, and if you don't or make the wrong move, you just fall. Um, the second rule is it's also a bit like climbing and hiking. Um, you don't just enjoy the results. When you're at the top, you've actually got to enjoy the journey and uh, you have to enjoy what you're doing because it's such hard work, including the juggling. And, and I enjoy what I do. And, and that I think is, is key. And the, the third one, which was actually advice given to me by older women in the profession when I got pregnant was, you have to make choices. 
you can't overcommit. Um, and actually, the night I received that GART award, I was uh, at home um, drafting an award. It was very late. I was exhausted because I'd been on it for weeks on end. And whilst a few people were having fun at the dinner, I was there drafting when I suddenly had emails popping out saying congratulations, and I had no idea what they were talking about. And that gave me the energy to continue uh, through the night. Uh, but when I talk about make, uh, making choices, this is absolutely fundamental because there's so much more I would like to do, I would like to contribute to uh, at work, but also outside work. But with two preteen girls, with the management of the firm, I have to make choices, and in particular, arbitral appointments. I have to uh, turn down appointments and be okay about it because otherwise I know I won't be able to do a good job. And sometimes it's painful, but it's absolutely necessary. Yeah, I agree. And I have to say from an, uh, the institutional point of view, it's heartening when people turn down appointments because of that important choice that has to be made. Yeah. Um, and I think that there's a, a great irony in the fact that the night you won that award, you were at home working on on an award while others were celebrating yeah. elsewhere. Yeah. Well, and I'm not criticizing those who were celebrating. Huh? I'm, I'm sure they, I, I think in the, on the circuit, people are good at making these choices. We just all make different choices. Being in management and having children, I've perhaps had to make different choices from other people. Right. Um, one thing that's, um, you know, important about your profile is the fact that you have been common law trained as well as civil law trained, both substantively and in terms of procedural law. Uh, and I wanted to ask you, um, to the extent that you can, um, you, you can measure this, but do you consider yourself more inspired by a common law approach or by a civil law approach to procedural decision making when you look back on your career as an arbitrator? It's a good question. It's one I'm often asked. Um, there's no denying that it, it, I initially trained in the common law system. So, you know, that's my base. And international arbitration is quite dominated, at least procedurally, by the common law system. Uh, and certainly 15 years ago, when I got my first appointment, actually in this, uh, roughly the same month from the LCA and the Swiss Chambers, um, if I'd been asked that question, I would have said common law. But looking back now, 20, after 20 years of practicing in civil law jurisdictions, um, I would say it's a mix and it depends on the parties, the issues, uh, who are the counsel, the co-arbitrators. So what, what I think I have, and I don't want to lack modesty, but is an ability to adjust depending who the players are as well. Now, I'm definitely a proponent of arbitrators exercising some control over the proceedings and over counsel with due consultation, of course, uh, but I don't have a complete hands-off uh, approach. But equally, I try to never lose sight of the fact that there is one party on a particular issue who bears the burden of convincing me and doing what it requires to convince me. So I try to never move too much into a more inquisitorial role when it comes to the substance of the proceedings. But it's, it's a balance. And I would say for most international arbitrators nowadays, you have to have that balance unless you are someone always practicing in the same jurisdictions uh, and hearing disputes governed by the same laws. But those of us who have a real mix have to adjust to really. Absolutely. Um, so you've served on the boards and several committees of different arbitral institutions. And um, as I said before, you've recently joined our council and our proceedings committee. I wanted to ask you, what do you consider to be one of the key contributions of an arbitral institution to its users? Actually, two questions. And secondly, how have you found uh, the work and the decision-making process uh, of the HKIAC now that you see its inner workings? Um, another very interesting question, because, you know, when I look back 20 years ago, there were far less arbitral institutions. There were the regional um, arbitral institutions were 
fewer, less known, but in the last 20 years, um, a lot of them have uh, become very prominent on the market through through a lot of marketing as well. It's let's say it, you know, events, publications, um, guidelines and reports on topical issues. But the key is really, we all know, is the quality of the support that an institution can provide to the process. Uh, not just the parties and the users, but actually counsel and arbitrators. So it's about supporting the uh, the process itself and balancing the different interests at stake in that process. Whether you're talking about arbitral appointments, challenges to arbitrators, uh, cost issues, uh, newer issues like emergency arbitration, consolidation, joinders. What we see is that these issues are a lot more complex, I think, than they were uh, 20 years ago. And it's not enough to have um uh you know some junior junior people at the secretary they have to be well trained they have to have the experience they have to be reactive they have to have the right diplomatic skills as well to deal with the with the different players and i have to say that's where you see the difference uh amongst the institutions uh in my view you still have a lot of international uh, institutions international that purport to administer international arbitration, but are actually quite parochial in the way they do it. Um, uh, and of course you're going to say, you would, have, you would have said that, but I had no idea what I was going to get when I uh, joined the HKIC Council and the Proceedings Committee. Uh, I have been hugely impressed, and I think I've written it several times, by the quality of the work of the Secretariat. So the quality of the case analysis, the quality of the materials we get to make the right decision, to make our decision, the diplomatic way in which the secretary puts forward a recommendation when it's actually for the members of the committee to decide. And all of this consistently, regardless of the size of the case, regardless of the nature of the case, there's consistency there. And for, for a new member like me, that's been invaluable. Uh, and of course, I've been very impressed as well by the reactivity of uh, the members of the proceedings committee and the quality of their own uh, contributions. So, so far, uh, very happy uh, and, and very inspiring, I think, in terms of the way an institution should work for, for, from what I've seen. Well, thank you, Domasi. That's wonderful to hear. And I have to say, from the Secretariat's point of view, we're so grateful to the members of the committee for their work and their analysis and their contribution. It's really, it adds such quality to, to the part that we play in the whole process. Um, so another aspect of our work at HKIC that has been a really important part of our work for a number of years is with respect to enhancing gender diversity, um, both in terms of arbitral appointments, but also, and I think very importantly, in, in terms of providing platforms to showcase female talent. And that's something that we're very committed to. We put on a number of events every year, a lot of events actually, and, and we always uh, showcase female talent as well as other talent um, uh, on our panels and our different um, speaking uh, platforms. Um, I know that this is also an area that you are committed to. Can you tell us a little bit about your commitment to this area and your work in this area? Yes, it's, it's definitely, if one can call it that, a pet subject. I don't think one should call it that, but uh, you, you, you see what I mean. I do, I do feel very strongly that uh, we all need, in particular us, the women in the profession, you need uh, to be committed to it. Uh, I often say half-joking that my first contribution was to not quit after I had my twin daughters. Um, despite a level of exhaustion that I didn't think one could live with, let alone uh, work with. Um, and it's only half a joke because I think it starts in the profession by having the right model. And in particular, uh, uh, when you're 50, like I am, I just turned 50 a few days ago, uh, you have to lead by example and you can't give up. But also, and that's the trick, you, you have to not hide the fact that sometimes it's tough. Because if you always pretend 
you're a superwoman and you can do it all. Uh, you know, you don't have 24 hours in a day, you've got 40. Uh, you're not necessarily going to inspire uh, the next generation because they look at you as someone who's doing something they'll never be able to do, which is completely untrue because we all have our moments of doubt. We all have moments where we're tired. We all have moments where we just want to, uh, uh, to give up. And that leads me to the third point, we have to support each other and be seen to support each other. Uh, that's in the firm, that's outside the firm, that's at events, that's supporting certain events and organizations. I'd like to think I've always tried to do this on the circuit through different uh, initiatives, um, I'm currently a champion of the um, Bradford uh, Equity Project for, for litigation finance. Uh, I've been involved with the pledge at the beginning, but my real uh, commitment is in the firm. I actually think that that's where we have to work because once you have gender parity at the table in law firms, you will have gender parity at the table outside law firms. And that would be in events, that would be in institutions, etc., and in arbitral appointments. I often say we don't have enough women being appointed because we don't have enough, they're not seen enough, but also because we don't have enough women partners in law firms by comparison to male partners. It's all a question of pool, if you see what I mean. So you have to make the pool uh, bigger. Now, I think our firm is great. We have a 30% uh, female equity partnership, which is very high by Swiss standards, but even by European standard, because we are a fully integrated law firm. We're not just sharing cost and premises like a lot of other firms in, in Switzerland. But as I heard Lucy Reed say last week uh, at a great event called uh, Mutox Those Days, I don't know if you've heard about it, it was started by a group of young women in in Europe during the start at the start of the pandemic uh, on invitation only but it's very big there were 90 of us and Lucy was one of the guest uh, invitee and she said the new glass ceiling is the 30 percent and she is so right about that mm -hmm. and I'm beginning to see that we are at 30 percent and suddenly it's an issue that perhaps doesn't need to be spoken about so much so why should it be 30%? We have 50% female associates, junior level, mid-level council. Um, we then drop to 30%. What does that tell us about the female talents? Where are the 20% gone? So huge challenge, never ending battle. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to think I'll see full parity before I retire, but I'm not, unfortunately I'm not sure. Yeah. We have to keep going. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, it's interesting you talk about the 30% ceiling. What, what I would observe over a number of years here was there seemed to be a 15 to 17% arbitral appointment ceiling. But as you say, it's a lot to do with the pool because it is limited and that, that's a pipeline issue. So it's, yeah, it's ongoing work. Yeah. Yes. Um, so, to my last question, it may be the hardest question, not to say that these questions have been easy, <laughs> but you are a French New Zealand dual national, as I mentioned, living in Switzerland. So, you have very strong connections to probably three of the most popular countries in the world. What would you say is the best thing each country has to offer? The one best thing from each? <laughs> I think answering it that way is very hard. Um, so I'm going to answer it another way. Um, and that's what they have in common. Because it is not by chance I ended up here after a very long uh, um, stay in New Zealand. The first one, the obvious one, you'd know that, that's the scenery. So in New Zealand, you have the wilderness here, you have the lakes and the mountains. And in France, you have the beautiful villages, the old city. Um, the second one is the wine. <laughs> we'll quickly brush over that one, but very important. Uh, and the third one is actually the people. 
and uh, also, uh, although, sorry, they're very different people, um, for me, that's been actually crucial to being in a happy place. So in New Zealand, the people are genuine, kind, uncomplicated, um, hardworking. In Switzerland, they are incredibly reliable, driven in the, in the positive sense, uh, straight, but open, very open. I used to be saying the Swiss were very conservative. They are, but they are open as well. And in France, well, in France, I mean, what can you say about the French? They are stylish, they are um, intense, um, they're dramatic, uh, but they're fun. So there you go. But it's a very long answer, but it was a very difficult question. Yeah, it's a great answer. <laughs> and I think all populations can be pleased. <laughs> well, exactly, exactly. Uh, well, the generalizations are very hard, yeah. but... Uh, uh, I certainly miss New Zealand less now that I'm based here. Yeah. Fantastic. Listen, Domiti, thank you so much for your time. It's been wonderful speaking with you, you and very much look forward to continuing to work with you. Thank you, Sarah, for inviting me. It was a real pleasure. Thank you.